Welcome to the Market Huddle with Patrick the Content Machine Serezna and Kevin the Macro Tourist Muir. So grab a drink, get comfortable, and get ready for a deep dive into the markets. Take it away, guys. It's February 8th, 2019, episode number 14. I'm Kevin Muir. And I'm Tony Greer. Usually Patrick is sitting across from me in the control booth, but he is once again out of town on business. But lucky for us, my pal, Tony Greer, graciously agreed to step into Patrick's shoes. Tony, thanks a bunch. Hey, man, you're welcome. Welcome. Any chance I get to huddle up with a fine Canadian over markets and beer without leaving my house? Sounds good to me, my man. Yeah. I actually have a funny story to tell you. Um, when we were editing last show that you were on, I guess that was two episodes ago, Patrick, uh, we do it Saturday morning, and Patrick sent me this text early in the morning. He said something to me. He says, I'm doing the edits, and I am pretty sure that I heard Tony open five beers. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I sent you a note. I said, did you really open five beers on the half shows that you, the, the half show you were on? And you know what you said? Yes. And I thought, my God, that's our kind of guy. That's a market huddle kind of guy. So we're going to basically invite that guy on whenever we can. Oh, nice, man. I'm honored to be here, and I'm glad I took the crown that way. That's fantastic. Yeah, you got the new record for the Market Huddle. Most beers drunk, so uh, I hope that you don't do 10 now that you're doing the whole show. Okay, so, uh, so um, Tony, you think you're ready to read Patrick's part? Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, this show is broadcast as both a podcast and on YouTube, so if you're enjoying this as a podcast and feel like you're missing out on the charts or videos we're referencing – you can register at markethuddle.com website or, or oh, excuse me, to get the weekly email, which includes the chart pack and video links, or just flip over to YouTube. So in this week's episode, we are going to talk about the cannabis markets and then do a little bit of a deep dive into the poor tape action. Uh, and we'll talk in uh, oh, the, the bad tape action social media stocks. Uh, then I'm going to tell a, uh, a tale from the trading desk from days of yore. And, in, and, and what else we so in, in this Our Week in Trading History segment, we will venture back to the near past when one year ago this week, the XIV short volatility ETN blew up. And for our WTF clip of the week, Powell and Trump have dinner Game of Thrones style. And then finally, we'll end with the five most important things to watch next week. All right, then. Let's get right into it, huh? Yeah, right. All right. So well, this, who's, the, uh, who's the show brought to us? Well, this week, it's actually um, Nickel Brook Brewing Company, and it's uh, a beer that I think is very apropos for the environment. It's called the Cause and Effect Beer. And uh, I think that uh, given that uh, Powell went dovish and the markets took off, I think that there's no better kind of cause and effect uh, example out there than that. So let's, let's open her up and see what it tastes like. Perfect, man. I'm digging in myself. Well, that's quite nice. Cheers. Yeah. So, uh, Tony, you're already doing better than Patrick in terms of not insulting our sponsors. Uh, he ah. seems to be has a regular habit of just saying how awful they taste. Uh, I keep trying to tell him not to do it, but he doesn't have any clues. So, um, anyway. Oh, well, I'm going to sit here with my mermaid pilsner um, of the Coney Island Brewing Company and enjoy it. Why don't, uh, why don't we get over to your legal stuff and then let's get into the markets. Right. Okay. So clients and employees of East West Investment Management may hold positions and securities mentioned in this podcast. Nothing in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment professional before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned in this show. For more information, please visit eastwestfunds.com. Side effects. I did it again. Side effects of too much market huddle may include hemorrhoids, mild rash, sticky wicket, swallowing of the tongue, intermittent ignorance, and may cause permanent loss of brain function. Okay, so let's get, on, let's get to this. Um, the first thing up is weed. Uh, it's, it's actually a great topic as a Canadian. Right, I know I, 20, we might add. Go ahead. I, yeah, that's right. We're starting at 420. We're taping this Friday at 420. Um, as a Canadian, I could pull an Elon Musk and actually, uh, instead of opening a beer, be smoking weed. Are you allowed as a, a Long Island resident to do the same? 
Uh, in my house, I am, definitely. <laughs> oh, really? I didn't know that. Is that, is that a, a Greer household the rule, or is that actually uh, yeah. the law? No, I... I actually don't even know what the what the what the standard rule is around here, but on my barrier island, it's uh, pretty prevalent, and there's nobody bothering anybody about it at any points. Oh well, so yeah. I think it's a great topic because as a Canadian, there's obviously uh, we were a little bit ahead of the curve versus the Americans, and a lot of these um, pot stocks that we're going to talk about today were actually Canadian listed. And when you sent me your list of uh, charts to pull up, I was kind of amused that the first one was the HMMJ ETF, which is the Canadian ETF for pot stocks. Yeah. Yeah. I figured follow, uh, follow the one right at the source. I like the composition of it. And, uh, you know, certainly the chart is trading like a frontier market um, bucking Bronco that you would expect. It's um. So, what are you thinking about this? So, you you're you're if I remember right, a big bull on not only like pot itself, but also the the actual companies. Yeah, I don't mind. Uh, I like well, I'm more more into trading them as frontier industry. Really, you know, when the, when the industry is this young and the can the calculus changes, you know, almost every day as the headlines progress. Um, it's really it's really anybody's guess as to how the stocks are going to trade. And having lived through, you know, the birth of the dot-com era and, and, you know, seeing this type of volatility, nobody really knows what's going on. So that's when stocks tend to behave fairly well technically. And, you know, the, the, the nature of this frontier industry has proven you right as a trader if you sort of buy the dips and, you know, hold on to your – hold on for dear life. And then you've got the next bullish incremental headline that comes out and, and you know, the stocks get on a good several day or hopefully week run out of that, um, you know, and then you get to, to times just like last October with, with the rec rec legal, um, excuse me, the legalization of recreational weed in Canada. Uh, and that was like the sell the fact event of all time, you know, one that you can use to teach your kids what sell the fact events are. Um, you know, right, right up into having that slide into the end of the year that was really um, a, 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 an extended bout of tax law selling. And what was interesting to the technical guys like me, when something makes a new low like that and, and takes it back right away, um, that's a signal to buy in. So it, it let off some really good signals to get long um, right away this year. And then we got, you know, um, I guess some of the recent news that's been out has helped things trade right to the top of the range again. So I'm staying positive on them, Kev. Okay, so let's just go through here. I'm pointing the chart, uh, the October legalization of the Canadian uh, marijuana. Was this this move up in, above 25 that I'm looking at? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right down to the gap open higher. That's right. So it was just a textbook all baked in. Everyone was excited about it. It opened, it gapped higher. I guess it closed higher that same day, but then within the next day, it gapped higher again and then closed lower. And then the, by the next day, it was back in the range. Is that right? Yeah, then the slide began through the moving averages. Exactly. Uh, I, I agree with you that this is something that we should put, uh, be teaching our kids in terms of uh, a, a textbook example of, of just the right. news being all baked in. And you kind of thought to yourself, at this point, who doesn't know that it's going to be legal in Canada? Who isn't buying the stock? And I'll tell you something, as Canadian, um, it's just, it's huge, not just in terms of how much we smoke, because Canadians do smoke a lot more pot than almost everybody else. Um, but we also yeah. love our pot stocks. And it's just something that uh, is every Canadian is talking about. And I'll tell you, uh, there are so many guys I know on Bay Street that have made themselves fortunes. I'm just talking fortunes uh, in yeah. terms of... Uh, either being long it or doing banking for these guys. It's been just a huge money maker. So we had the move down from 25 on, on kind of the legalization move. And then it went all the way to the end of the year. And to me, like, is that December 24th, the, the infamous kind of uh, Trump, exactly. uh, like the massacre mm -hmm. on the 24th. And yeah. then we've been running back up. And just to get a sense of the volatility, let's just think about this. It went from 26 down to 14 and is back up at 21. So as a percentage, yeah. these moves are huge. And that's an index. That's not just individual stocks. That's the whole right. index. So now right. you have some stocks you wanted to talk about. Yeah, let's go through them here and see which one it is. Um, the first one is Cron. You yeah, Cron. 
Quran is just a really good example of, you know, reading the price, how, the, how this market has offered opportunities of reading the price action um, and taking action after that. We had Quran um, come out in December. The, I circled the, um, the big gap higher. That's when um, Altria Group announced their partnership with Kronos Group. Um, for one with, a, you know, I guess they put in $1.8 billion um, and got a large stake in the company. But if you watch how the stock traded after that against that huge tidal wave in the S&P that took it, you know, to a new low for the year, you know, Kronos Group, I was watching Kronos Group and trying to decide if I should bid, you know, eight, nine or 10 to get long it. And I watched the thing just break down to the 1500 day moving average at about 13 um, and it can't, you know, the year turned that I was never able to get it. Um, and one of the first names I bought this year was Kronos Group. And then you get lucky um, with, you know, the, the performance that you get literally coming out of the gate as it breaks through the highs at 20 there. And so this is just, you know, I'm sure it's just new institutions and funds coming after the name, et cetera, et cetera. But as the calculus changes, everybody has to change their exposure. So these all stay in play, Kev. And the way, you know, the way to look at Kronos Group now is I would be buying dips back, back towards 20 because I think that their partnership with Algier Group is going to make them a leader in, you know, obviously going to make them a leader in the space and knock out a whole bunch of their competition. So that, that I'm playing this in a very basic nuts and bolts kind of way, and it's been working. It, it's crazy how much, like, the volatility makes it just a trader's paradise. Like, yeah. Like, Think about that. That's the one month. The thing's gone from 13 bucks. It, it, what, it ticked above? It was $33 there for a bit? Yeah. Like, it, like that's crazy volatility. And these are big name companies. These aren't like little, like, uh, rinky dink little junior mines. These are big names that you're playing with and big numbers. Okay, yeah. so let's go on to the next one, CGC, which is Canopy Growth. Now, for the Canadians that are listening to this call, this is actually, we have a much better symbol for this in Canada. Do you know that's what it is in Canada? That's weed CN. Yeah, it's weed. Like we, I, I, I guess they didn't allow that or they didn't want to do that in the States. But our symbol for this stock is uh, weed, W-E-E-D, which I think is great. Um, it's actually one of the kind of the uh, uh, poster childs for the Canadian success story. And I can see it's a little more developed and it's not quite running as much as the cron, is it? Right. No, I think, you know, this, there's, uh, there's a lot that is, uh, as you say, baked into, um, no pun intended, <laughs> kind of growth. And that's, I guess, just because, you know, they're, they're, they're benefiting. Number one, they've got the benefit of having Constellation brands at their back, right? So they're going to supply all the capital that Bruce Linton needs to build and brand Canopy Growth as the best in class. So they've got the capital advantage um, with the farm bill, um, the legalization of the farm bill last year, that's going to expand the U.S. market, um, the, the, excuse me, legalization of hemp in the farm bill at the end of last year is gonna you know, open up the US market. Canopy Growth's partnership with Ebu is going to allow them to take uh, CBD out of hemp at a much faster pace than any other company out there. So they're gonna be the leader in, I can see them being the leader in hemp production. I can be, see them being the leader in um, you know, growth for medical purposes and dispensaries. And with, you know, with the full, full, I guess support of, of Constellation brands behind them. Uh, those are the sort of th those are the names that I want to keep stacking my chips as the odds become you know the odds on favorite that these are the ones that are going to survive and thrive, and some of the others are going to unfortunately have to fail. What did Constellation brands pay for their uh, CG, CGC uh, stake? Because well, I think uh, that they were offside like like huge like within within kind of days. I think they had lost a hundred million bucks or something, right? Do you yeah, I'm, try, I'm trying to remember. I can just go back. Hold on. I should just look it up. It's, I usually have a number, but I'm trying to I'm it's, forgetting and what it's it is. It's crazy um, the amount that they're, they're paying. They're paying oftentimes these deals that the, um, to get a block of this company, you'll have to stop dollars. trading. You know, what, what did they pay? Sorry? They, put, they, just, they just put another $4 billion in, right? Into um, it, but at what price? That's to get them to 38% from 9.9%. Um, but what I find amazing about a lot of these stories is that these big guys will come in and the stock will be trading in like, I don't know, 45 bucks, let's just say for a canopy growth. And they'll come in and they'll buy a big piece at 60 bucks because yeah. they just want to be in the industry so badly and they'll just be, they'll pay up and they'll know that they can't buy it in the marketplace 
so that they'll just come to the company direct and say, okay, what, at what price do you sell me X percent of your company? Yeah, but it's for, you know, it's at a survival cab, you know, beer sales just keep going lower and lower. And these guys are going with the calculus as it changes. And I think it makes all the sense in the world for them. You know, I can't agree with the multiples, but whatever they want to get to get control, that's, that's the direction they're going. They may as well just get control rather than, than, you know, so around. Think they're, a lot of times they're not even getting control. All they're doing is ending up uh, uh, in, like they're just buying pieces. They're just making sure that they're part of the, of this new industry. Yeah. So I well, think it's kind of crazy. It's, like I, I think it's nuts, but we'll go on. Let's, let's let you go through your charts. The next one is the village farms. So is this kind of uh, tell us a little bit about this one? Yeah, this is a, this is um, basically a vertically integrated greenhouse um, with, with presence in British Columbia, Texas, um, Mexico or oh, British Columbia and Ontario also. So they have, um, they're just a large greenhouse grower. They have the venture with Emerald Therapeutics, um, you know, a medicinal company in Canada. And I just like the move. They just recently applied for a NASDAQ um, listing and you got to just like the way something like this trades, uh, you know, straight up and back. And I just feel like this is one of the, you know, I, I'm, I've been following the stock alongside Todd Harrison, the expert by far. Um, in the space and you know that i'm encouraged that they're going for a nasdaq listing and i if if these guys are thinking that they're going to be a leader in the space then i'm not taking my eye off the name oh does todd like this one as well is this one of his picks yeah absolutely at oh, this I point i mean you know there's a huge gap on the chart um i guess going back to their nasdaq listing news and uh you know any day you got to buy this thing on any dip to see down to five dollars now now, Tony, I'll tell you what I worry about with all this. And I, I you know, hats off to you. I've, you're terrific at seeing a trend, climbing aboard, and just riding that bucking bronco. And, uh, and, and this is, it's no surprise to me that these are the kind of stocks you're trading and that you're, that you're buying them and making money. I personally see these things and they scare the bejesus out of me. And, I, and I'll tell you why. So I look at it and um, I think they're getting fueled by big guys like mall like altria and uh, uh, constellation coming and buying these companies out of fear like you say that they need a, a piece of this action yeah but the valuations for these things are just so insane and and i feel like they're just these these other companies they're going to look back at what they paid for these companies these marijuana companies and they're just going to shake their heads and wonder what they were thinking and i and i made a little chart here and i basically did the market capitalization of five big kind of pot stocks, Canadian pot stocks. And mm -hmm. just kind of like from August of 2018, it was, you know, 20 billion. And within the next, what, three months leading up until that October kind of uh, legalization, uh -huh. they added, you know, 40 billion of market cap. Like this is like, this is billion. This yeah. isn't like, these are big, big numbers and you can see it's come off since and stuff. But to me, I look at this and it reminds me so much. You've already mentioned this, but it reminds me so much of the dot-com bubble. I like, I can't even describe it. The dot-com bubble was based upon the idea that the internet would change the world. And it did. There's no doubt about it. The internet was fundamental. It was a fundamental change in the way our society operated. But tell me what stocks you could have bought in like March of 2000 that would have made you money for the next five or 10 years. Well, that's not, none, but you're making the assumption that we're in March of 2000 in the cannabis space. And I think you're, you're off by at least five years. Okay. So <laughs> that could very well be. I'm always early. So your yeah. argument is that, that, that this is kind of uh, 96 yeah. And the market is just waking up to cannabis and, and that we're going to see much more kind of growth ahead of us. Yeah, this is me. This is me figuring out that I can order DVDs to my apartment in New York City and download them on my computer and then download them onto my, you know, Sony, you know, Walkman um, device and go running in Central Park with a little tiny device in my hand instead of carrying a DVD player. Yeah, listen. You know, it's early because there's no, there's the, the application isn't widespread 
but enough to know even how big the markets are going to be yet. And, you know, we're talking, you know, we're, we're kind of focusing right now on the recreational use of it when it's very much a dual revolution that's taking place with the legalization of this drug. You know, it's something that, you know, with, with, an endo, with, with endocannabinoids in your human body system, the wellness side of this trade is going to be, I mean, it's going to be as big. If, I mean, I think eventually it's going to be bigger than the recreational side of this trade, you know, because I mean, the list of, of ailments that cannabis is beneficial to is long and very serious. You know, like look at a company like GW Pharmaceuticals that's got, you know, Epidiolex, which is a drug that's helping, you know, child uh, children have, with their epilepsy fits. Um, you know, that's something that parents will pay for. And that's something that a big drug company is eventually going to have to get a hold of someday, um, no matter how. And I'm waiting for that to be one of the next headlines. And, you know, I think there's just so much more development than I can even conjure that's going to happen in this industry that I don't, I, you know, I, I don't, I, I try to, st I still look at it as burning young, you know, rather than mature. And so that's, I guess, maybe why I have a totally different viewpoint on it than you. Yeah. Well, no, you know, and that's a great viewpoint. It very well could be that I'm really early and uh, that I'm kind of looking for the, the thing to peak, I guess, being a Canadian and seeing how much money is going around and the crazy valuations that just yeah. out of nowhere. And I'll tell you one thing for sure. You might be right in terms of the entire market, but there are going to be some epic disasters in here. And I really oh, yeah. believe, and, and, and I'm going to tell you a quick story that I had. So one of the things we talk to um, often to uh, debt guys who lend money on the private side on debt. And uh, we had this, this fellow that came to us and I was asking him about the marijuana, whether people were lending to the marijuana companies. And he said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of scared about lending to marijuana companies. I said, why is that? And he says, well, let me tell you a story about when I, I when my first marijuana deal. He said it was a father-son team that came to him and they had some greenhouses in uh, Niagara Falls, which is, uh, you know, just south of Toronto. Mm -hmm. And they, he decided, the, the, the son-in-law wanted to get into the marijuana business. So they needed some money. So they came to this guy and they said, listen, we, you know, we want some money to expand and to, to make some greenhouses for marijuana. And the guy looked at him. He says, listen, this is what I'll do. I'll lend you money against your company as a tomato operator. So I'll figure out what it's worth as a tomato operator and I'll lend you money based upon that. So they got the, the kind of the valuation for the tomato operation and the, sure enough, it's 10 million bucks or something like that, you know, between the greenhouses and all the land and stuff. The guy says, I'll lend you 8 million bucks. Okay. So he writes a check for 8 million bucks and whatever. Sure enough, kind of, you know, six months to a year later, he turns it into a marijuana company and someone else lends the money based upon their marijuana valuation. And so all they did was go out and get a license and grow something different. What do you think that eight, that $10 million valuation got changed to? Oh my God. If you say less than five, I'll get like no, no, it got out. changed the other way. It went absolutely crazy. It got valued at like 90 million or some crazy number like that. And what happened was that they, some, some other, you know, Schmo lent them 75 million against their operation. And what I worry oh, about is, is that in 2000, uh, it, you know, it made sense to lend money to Nortel and Cisco because that was great business. And I really worry about a lot of these companies that at the end of the day, you know, weed is a, is, is a weed. And, and I don't know, like, I don't know how, you know, we as Canadians, I, I understand, I, I get it. You're going to tell me all about that. There's certain, uh, you know, technology to make that they grow certain strains and all this stuff. I just worry that at the end of the day, it's a commodity and it'll go down to the lowest, you know, denominator. And we as Canadians won't be able to compete, especially since the biggest input is, is, you know, is electricity and often like in Ontario, our electricity is really expensive. Anyways, I just look at this thing and it, to, it like, it just feels 2000 to me. It uh. feels frothy. It feels scary. And uh, I hope you're right. Like I do. As a Canadian, nothing would make me more happy than for us to be the, uh, we're already kind of the cannabis capital of, of the world. Nothing would make me more happy than for us to continue to be that way. But I worry in my heart of hearts, and maybe it's just kind of my, my uh, the nature of seeing too many butt bulls break, 
that this is a bubble and I worry that it's in the later innings than you think it is. But you know, that's what makes a market and yeah. uh, you're much better at surfing the wave while it's out there than I am. And uh, I, I, I hope you're, I hope you're right. Uh, I'm just trying to stay alive, man. I'm just trying to That's stay right. alive. <laughs> That's right. So let's move on to the second one. The, you know, the second thing you wanted to talk about, which is social media stocks. Um, another kind of frothy uh, kind of uh, sector. I guess that's you. You love going to those names that are a little bit more action. and a little, You're a true trader that way. And uh, one of the first ones that you brought up was Facebook. Why don't you tell me what your thesis is on uh, social media stocks and what you're worried about or, or looking at? Yeah, well, I've been, you know, I've been bearish um, generally to social media ETF, but we'll talk about Facebook in general. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really a lot about the curtain coming down on surveillance capitalism. And it's about Facebook, you know, getting caught eight ways through Sunday doing dishonest business, you know, from the Cambridge Analytica, um, you know, data breach um, to learning how, you know, the extent to which they're sharing all of your information um, to learning the fact that, you know, they were overcharging children for playing games on Facebook and then making it difficult for, you know, parents to go and get their money back. And I just it, feel like, like they're like, it, That's just crazy. Like I heard that one and that one blew yeah. my mind. Like they, like how evil these guys are. Like it really, like, I hate to say that word, but like yeah. they really are evil. Like it's terrible. Yeah. You know, and when you get to the point where, you know, you, when you, when you get to the point where everybody gets freaked out, which is you just have a conversation about something or a Facebook conversation about something. And next thing you know, the ad is in front of you. And that's something that people have finally sort of, you know, like stepping into an electric fence, you know, finally woke them up about surveillance capitalism. Like, Oh, Oh, this is kind of weird. You know, this is kind of futuristic dystopian. I'm not sure if I'm comfortable with that. And I'm, my, my bet um, is that over time, people are going to get less and less comfortable with that and wind up just leaving the platform. I feel like Facebook is literally being kept alive by, you know, the powers that be, you know, with help from the powers that be in the government that, you know, want to continue to get information and the people in the markets that want to continue to get information so they can market to us. And I think that eventually people are going to reject it. So, you know, I've been, I've been a seller of the social media ETF. I'm a seller on this rally. I want to sell Facebook on rallies and I haven't put a position on in this particular stock yet since it rallied on earnings. But man, I'm looking at that. I'm salivating at this gap from 165 down to 150 and I'm going to be hopefully in it for some portion of that on the way down. I think that's a great call. Um, who, who's uh, Jesse Felder has been all over this for a long time in terms of the social implications of all these social media companies and what they're doing to us. Yeah. And I must say, I, I'm sympathetic to the idea. I find even like, so I, I just go on Twitter. I'm not, I don't have a Facebook account. I've never had one. Um, but I do go on Twitter and I know that uh, it's easy to call, kind of fall into a, a trap and spend a little too much time on there. And it's unproductive time and it doesn't even make you feel good. Um, and I know yeah. uh, Jesse Felder has been taught, you know, he took it away from his kids. Uh, he, he, he took it away from himself. I think he's gone to a, a feature phone, which is kind of, I don't know why they call them feature phones because there's no features on them, but, uh, where, right. where you can't even look at these things. Um, I, I'm not going to poo poo them. I'm not going to be like some old curmudgeon and say nobody should have Facebook and stuff, but I do believe that there's some, especially that are exceptionally nefarious. And I think Facebook is, is shocking when you find this, this information, what they were doing, trying to entice young kids to go do it. Like, I'm like, it's one thing to pick off, uh, you know, a stupid, uh, somebody that's willing to advertise to them, but it's another thing to be picking off, you know, little kids. And, yeah. uh, it's just, I remember there's that, that meme on, uh, with, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, it says something about like, it was a quote from him, uh, from when he first started Facebook. And it's something like the dumb fox trust me. And like, I, I, I think that's, that's so true. Like we as a society have been trusting them for way too long. And not only that, it doesn't even, it doesn't have the, the social positive features that we think it does. It, it no, doesn't it's, even, it, like it's not even good for us. Yeah, exactly. No, it's pretty crazy. You know, when you start to peel back the onion and realize that his uh, motto of move fast and break shit was about the constitution, you know, and just, <laughs> yeah, literally, you know, I mean, the guy when. um, 
one of the best articles I've read about it is in um, TechCrunch magazine. Um, I think it's called The Facts About Facebook, but I'll dig it out for you. And um, it was just really, you know, it was well put. It was just, you know, put it right, put Facebook right back to where it started. Um, and the, uh, the author um, says, you know, let's remember that this was formed in a dorm room by a young kid that was, you know, trying to, you know, put a grade on, you know, girls' looks without them knowing, you know. And yeah. so how did this suddenly become, you know, the giant, you know, beast that it is? And let's just sort of keep it in its place for a little while, you know. And I, I tend to agree wholeheartedly with that because the kid's got too much power with the little experience that he has, no matter what anybody says. And, you know, I think that is all going to filter through to the stock because the way that they've been handling the crisis one after one has been just literally pathetic. So. Well, I agree. I think that it like all these social media stocks and also I hate to tell you this, the weed stocks have been huge kind of liquidity plays. So yep. to me, I'm worried they're going to mo move more together than you think. But anyways, let's go on to the next name here. Like this is your uh, your kind of go to short, right? The the S O C L. Yeah, you know it's because it gives you a, ch a chance to pounce on Jack Dorsey at Twitter as well. Um, and, you know, and then you've got Google and Snapchat and Spotify and everything in there. Um, and I feel like that whole sector, um, you know, especially the last leg of the last two years, which we, which you've got shown there, um, that was the real overvaluation period for social media stocks. And, you know, like we discussed Facebook already. Twitter is another big part of this um, ETF. And, you know, their earnings spoke for themselves this week. The stock went down 10%. It looks like, you know, it looks like they're doing pretty well, actually, in the revenue department with like $900 billion, excuse me, $900 million in revenue. So it's approaching a billion dollars a quarter. Um, but, uh, you know, one of, the one of the best things I heard somebody say about Twitter is that I feel like, or I think it was probably Rudy Havenstein, um, is that I feel like it's operated by one of its competitors, which I <laughs> tend to agree with. You know, it's like one of those, it's one of those uh, applications that, you like using because it's so useful and it will drive you mad at the same time, you know, by throwing your timeline out of whack, um, you know, and you're seeing tweets from four minutes ago and then you're seeing a tweet from 17 hours ago yeah. and then four hours ago and then 20 minutes ago, you know, and then it was, you know, then there's the whole thing about the way he treats conservatives versus liberals. So he's, you know, you know, opening it up that you're stepping into a slippery slope, non-level playing field. Um, and I think that that is going to ultimately reflect um, in the stock price with, you know, probably diminishing users. I think the most serious people on Twitter are Fintwit, to be honest with you, although I'm not exposed to the whole world, you know, but that uh, seems to so be the most serious group. I, now, I'll, I'll be honest. I use Twitter. I think it's for a trader, it's in, invaluable. I kind of view it as my uh, trading tape. I love seeing what uh, the sentiment is on there seeing what people are thinking. I think it's, it's a terrific tool for traders. Um, for everyone else, I don't understand why anyone else goes on it because to me, it's, it's uh, when I first plugged it in, I remember it felt so much like I was plugging into like a, a garden hose, like or not a garden yeah. hose, like, a, like a worse than a garden hose, like uh, the, the fire hydrant. I felt like they had just opened up the fire hydrant and just came flooding at me and I didn't know what to do with it. So uh, I'm not I, like I, I'm kind of confused why anyone would use it apart from traders, but for traders with our kind of uh, like uh, we feel like a little bit like traders kind of are like rats on acid, like they're just kind of all over the place and crazy. And uh, to me, it's the perfect vehicle. Um, but I, I, I definitely feel that uh, the the bloom has come off of all these social media stocks. Yeah, and that we're that we as a society are waking up. And and the other thing is. Have you ever clicked on an ad? Like, I don't understand how these, these companies keep making all this money on advertising because to me, my brain already shuts all the ads off. And, and not only that, like I, I, the, the fellow I work with, he's a computer science uh, kind of guru and he basically puts ad blocks on all my stuff. I don't even see ads. Yeah, I, uh, same as you. I mean, you know, you got to condition your brain to look right past them. Same, you know, same thing on Twitter, same on Instagram. You know, you know when there's a post on there that's not, you know, one of the people that you follow and your thumb goes speeding right by it. Yeah. Um, so I agree with you that it's got to be hard for them to actually get a bang for their buck for those advertisements. But I would imagine that it just gets a really widespread message sent. So that's part of it. 
So, so you're looking, you're, you're basically, are you short this name? Like this is something you're actively short and it's, it's your yeah. selling all rallies. Well, I just added it to my uh, view matrix and wrote about it. Um, when the news came out this week, um, that, uh, you know, the news out of Germany that they were finally going to basically suspend Facebook and not allow them to continue to do what they're doing, which is basically, you know, take user information without letting them know. So we, uh, this is exactly playing out how Scott Galloway um, at NYU said that it was going to play out. And so I'm trying to follow the storyline here and sell rallies. And um, we got a beautiful rally in the CTF right back to the 200 day moving average. We got so that new- yellow line at 32 bucks. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. Yeah, just, yeah, exactly. Just picked, yeah. Right. So I was sitting there literally, literally just totally spectating, watching and deciding whether, you know, watching it and see, well, you know, with no position saying, let's see whether it's going to go through uh, the 200 day or not. And luckily, Josh Brown put out a really, really widespread piece about the 200 day moving average that was called I will build a wall of the 200 day moving average this last week. And I think it was a very important thing for technical indicators where Josh basically capitulated on the 200 day moving average and said, look, this isn't some magic number, which is true. Um, and he wrote about it very well, um, you know, for somebody that's not a technician. And now I'm telling you that 200 day moving average is going to hold on every single chart that you look at. Come on. You right? think Josh has got that much power? No, I'm just telling you that like, I love that. He's, <laughs> I love that he's like the most popular guy on FinTwit. And he's out there kind of, you know, not bashing it, but telling you like it is like, look, the 200 day moving average is not some magic number. Don't expect the market to stop there. Don't expect it to hold there. Don't expect. And then it stopped there. And then it stopped there. That like right. after the saying that. Did, the S&P <laughs> did. I mean, you could point that. The S&P did. Fang did. Social <laughs> media ETF did. I mean, we can go right down the line where they just held like a rock this week on the rally. That's and then funny. Faded. And, yeah, that's yeah, the reason. I actually because- watched. I actually watched Josh's um, kind of, he has a little t- YouTube show and I watched it and he talked about the uh, 200 day moving average with, with, what's his sidekick there? Like uh, Mike is a, uh, I don't know, whatever his sidekick. Michael the, the, Badding, also a very yeah. smart guy. These guys. Yeah. So they, uh, so they went and they had a little YouTube show about it. And uh, it was, it was interesting because they ended, ended like, it was all about the 200 day moving average and whether it worked. And they were of the opinion that, that it worked but they, nobody could actually like trade on it. So even though they kind of thought it worked, they kind of shit all over it. So don't- yeah, you know, they, 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 they tend to shit all over the tactical trading people, you know, and I feel like they look at markets like you can't just get in and get out when you want, you know? I mean, you can shift around your day trading account, your 401k. I mean, you could take 20 funds in your 401k to cash with the stroke of a pen that one day get back in the next day and probably not get charged for it. So that's why I, you know, sort of oppose all the rhetoric about, you know, sort of, you know, don't listen to the tactical trader here type of thing. But, you know, everybody has their place in the markets and their beliefs about what to do. But I just believe that liquidity and it's been made so easy for you to change your position in the markets that it's almost like being standing there on the exchange floor. You know, you want to get out oh, of something, yeah. you hit the bid guy standing across from me you want to get back in and you push the other button you know like, it's it's, so. it's better than it ever was like a retail investor can go and transact with like a penny wide market and yeah. pay almost no commission it's insane yeah. how easy it is and, and yeah. in fact it's never been easier for the retail investor or the retail trader to make money like these markets yeah. are unbelievably like when i started we had like eight wide markets and you basically paid if you were a retail person you paid another eight to kind of trade it and it was something that most stocks barely moved and now right. all of a sudden these stocks are moving around you could trade for a you know eight bucks or five bucks and yeah. per trade and, and it's a penny wide market it yeah. listen for institutional traders it sucks like this is a terrible market like i can't tell you as I've come back into working for, you know, a portfolio manager slash hedge fund, I can't tell you how bad it is when I go try to execute size. It is so, uh, oh, 
I just, it makes me want to like barf. Nobody will trade with me. If I go post something in terms of size, all that happens is everybody runs ahead. If I see something on the, like on the depth of the book where something, there's a decent piece offered above and I want to just buy up to that point, I go try to buy it and it's all gone. Like, right. No wonder and everyone, they're, putting, they're putting people in jail for spoofing. Yeah, and, and no wonder everyone VWAPs or TWAPs all the time now because the reality is that trying to actually execute at one price for at one standstill point is so difficult. It just sucks. Like, it really well, sucks. That's because, I, that's because the high frequency traders have given license to steal in front of you all day long, Kev. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, you can put, if you put an honest to God bid for 100,000 shares of stock in there, you wouldn't buy a share, and the high frequency trader would be going to Vegas with the money that he made front running your order. Yeah, it just sucks. Anyway, so I just think for retail investors, don't complain because this is uh, uh, just so great. And for oh, the playing field so, has been leveled. Yeah. For you. Are you kidding? Yeah. No, I completely think I, I, I really look back to like my time when I sat on a, on a desk. Let's just talk about like Twitter going back to this thing, even though we're shitting all over it in terms of saying how bad it is for our kind of from a societal point of view or from a, even from a trading uh, from a, like a stock price point of view. But as, from a trader point of view, it's invaluable. I get to talk to people that I would never have ever been able to talk to. If you're a young person right. today and you want to learn about the market, it is way easier. Like I went to an institutional desk and I was lucky enough to sit beside some great traders and learn how to trade. But you know, not everyone gets that. And it used to be only passed down to a few people. Nowadays, you can go onto Twitter and, and just get a wealth of information from really, really smart people. And, and, and the, a lot of them will take the time and actually teach you stuff. Like, you know, yeah, there's, yeah, there's yeah, the, I, the guy from Hayek's and Keynes, which is a, which is a guy from Bridgewater. Like yeah. he's teaching you stuff that's like inside baseball and that you would never, ever have been able to be privy to before. Right. The way, the way you kind of, the way I look at it is, you know, you kind of said it without saying it exactly, but there we're sort of recreating the trading desk on Twitter because if you walk around on a trading desk now, they're pretty much absolute silence when I'm sure when you and I were starting in the business, at least we were still in the era of, you know, standing up, barking out orders to, you know, a salesperson and then barking out orders to your liquidity. And it was very physical and very, very emotional. And, you know, that was all part of the deal. And now it's all, everything is clicks and clicking in and clicking out and all that part of the business has changed. You know, there's not even as many people, there's not even half as many people talking to each other through all this trading that's going on. So I think the Twitter thing is you recreated the trading desk and you have to figure out the new decorum and figure out how to get information and build relationships with people electronically. It's a very different world. Yeah. And what a great segue into the tales from the trading desk. Cause I think you have a story for us that is more reminiscent of the old days on a trading desk. Why don't you tell us? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to tell this story because I look at I look around and in the world of safe spaces and in the world of quiet trading. Desks, That's a microaggression. That's a microaggression, Tony. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it is a microaggression, Kev. Well, but like, and I walk around at desks now and everything is really quiet and I just shake my head because I'll just recall one story like I was recalling the other day where, um, you know, as a sales trader at Dolman Rose, I was trying to put some block trades together with some of the other type A sales traders on this desk. Um, Come on, and I there, was type, there was type A's on the sale, on the trader yeah. desk? Yeah, you know what it is. I'm just, you know, I'm stressing that because there were like, you know, six of us sitting in a small bucket you know, all trying to, you know, kill as much as we could. And uh, this one day we're working our butts off to try to put a, a print together in the airlines between two mutual funds. Um, and we've got our manager, Ernie Dahlman is out on the street and he's got his, basically his head trader trying to sort of discipline the traders and get us to do something uh, essentially that, that we were kind of just blowing off. And he was trying to see if we were going to come to this, uh, this event that he was, was having and we were very focused like our sleeves were rolled up and our elbows were bleeding trying to put this print up um, and then all of a sudden he kind of pushed us too far and um, we got an email from you know the head trader and he was saying that you know Ernie needs results uh, Ernie needs our uh, you know attendance for this event immediately 
So I wrote back to Ernie. I was like, you know, and this is the guy that runs the firm and a very good friend of mine. And I was like, man, we're working on something here. And I was a little bit nasty. And I was like, get this guy off of our back right now, or there's going to be nobody sitting here in a week when you walk back in here. And as it turned out, he was on his way back to the office. So that was kind of real lousy for me. Um, Ernie makes his way up to the trading desk and he's fuming and he's fuming at me, but we were really trying to make money. He walks in the door and he goes, Greer, go home. And I was like, <laughs> get lost. I'm not going home. I can't make any money from home. Whoa, you know, I'm whoa, a this is your boss. Your boss told you to go home and you told him to get lost. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because I, you know, this is in the days when, you know, you're working at a shark tank as a commission broker and you're fighting to put every dollar up for that firm that you can, because you can mathematically calculate your piece of it. And you know, when that's how you're feeding your family, you don't let those trades go by. And he tried to send me home and I was like, dude, we're working on this trade. That's why you pissed me off in the first place. And he goes, get in my office. And I'm like, all right, I'll get in his office. So he turns around and walks into his office and I get myself set up on the trading desk to be able to walk away. And I couldn't wait to walk into his office. I was like, man, I am going to turn the tables on this guy. Like he's never had him turned on him before. And I, this is a guy that I know. So I'm trying to figure out my chess match on the way down there. Um, Cause Ernie's a really smart guy. So I figured the best thing I could do is like, just get his attention right away. And I walk in and he's looking at the window steaming and I grabbed this gigantic door and I slam it as hard as I could and if I'm telling you Kev the whole, whole trading floor shook the windows on you know every connecting office shook when I slammed that door and Ernie turned around and we were face to face for about five minutes screaming at each other and then he finally heard something that I said that was you know really about you know we're trying to put this print up and make your firm look good and everything like that and like he had this epiphany and he looks at me he goes oh, all right, man, I'm sorry. And he gives me a big hug, you know, and I was very relieved because I didn't know if he was going to fire me right in that office, et cetera, et cetera. But it was just, it, I just kind of brought that back because it was interesting, like in the world 10 years ago, how like nothing like that would ever take place on a trading floor. You know what I mean? Like we would probably both be fired or at least I would have been fired. And uh, it was just a good sign at the times that that's what it was like when they're, you know, the commission brokers were, you know, as basically as powerful as the guys running the firm. That's a great story, Tony. Actually, you know what? I, I, it, it reminds me of a story that I had, um, and I'm going to tell it real quick. But I worked on a Canadian broker, like an institutional equity derivative desk. And at one point, we bought the guys from Kidder Peabody. And so there was this group that came in, and they were aggressive New Yorkers. And we were just these uh, you know, Canadians that were more interested in drinking beer and enjoying ourselves than uh, actually – fighting in the big, you know, in the trenches with these guys. Yeah. And they came and this one guy came to us and told us at like a, a night out, he told us, we're going to cut your boss's balls off and shove them down his throat. And we were like, holy smokes, did we just hear that? Right. Like, you know, yeah. this guy works for our firm. Like, you know, it's like, this is, this is supposed to be kind of, you know, one of our uh, coworkers that's, uh, you know, interested in making the firm better. And he's telling us this, right. And so to say that our group didn't get along with this other group is an understatement. But the interesting part about this story that I kind of love about it is that these guys came and they, they put a kind of a younger guy on the desk. He's about the same age as me. We were both late twenties and they yeah. put him on the desk to also trade index derivatives. It was slightly different role. And it was during the long-term uh, capital crisis management problem. Like the whole yeah. the market was like, it's uh, for those that are 98. Yeah, 98. So it was, it was kind of like the 08 of, of that generation. And uh, at one point, someone phoned up and wanted to bid on a big chunk of, uh, of tips, which is kind of like our spiders back then. Right. And I bid for it. And this guy said, I'll take some of those. And at this point, he was supposed to be kind of not taking my flow from me. And I kind of just, I'd had a tough day. And I'd had enough of these guys. And I just looked at this guy and I basically started screaming at him. And I basically had a fuck fight with him across the desk. And I'm not one to get into fights with people. Like I don't, I generally just avoid conflict. I'm not one to tell people that they're idiots or to, you know, one of these real harsh guys. But I had this huge fuck fight, like, you know, no, fuck you, no, fuck you. And we're going back and forth. The whole desk goes silent. And we're going back and forth. And I tell him that he's never going to take a piece of my trade. 
and that he, he can go fuck himself. I love and, the, this. and the funny thing about it was that, that after that, I kind of thought, oh, it's going to be so awkward going to work and stuff like that. And it was, I had made things, I didn't realize it, but I had made things so much better. Yeah. I, what I needed to do was kind of establish, like he, he's a, he was a true kind of New Yorker. And I guess you, you guys are a little different breed than us. And uh, you're just a little more aggressive. And to him, he was kind of testing me. And now he, he figured out where my limit was and we were good, you know, like everything was great. And yeah. so uh, it was kind of making me laugh that I realized that there was a culture difference in terms of like what we were expected and how kind of how the trading desk worked. And to him, this was just normal. He just kept trying until I, you know, until I had my kind of epiphany where I yelled at him and then he's like, okay, I guess there's the limit. Yeah. And so I yeah, always that's think, so you know, he was, he was experienced, you know, you guys were experiencing Kev, the law of the jungle, right? <laughs> like there's gotta be some type of, okay. You know, every, every male falls into the classification of an alpha, a beta, you know, a C or a group D male. And you know, that when, when, when there's conflict among two of them, you know, two type A's or whatever, they sort it out generally, you know what I mean? They either sort it out by fight or fleet, right? That's war, right. law of the jungle. So, it's either like, you know, you have it out and you hug it out or you fleet and you become, you know, no longer acquaintances. And I'll tell you, Ernie Dahlman walked in and, and to tribute to him and I'm a, still friends with him to this day. And, and that turns out, you know, it was a monumental event at the time, but it turns out to be literally a, a little bump, you know, in the course of our relationship. Um, but, you know, it was the kind of thing where we didn't know how it was going to go. And he came in the next morning and he gave me a big hug right on the desk. And he's like, I'm so glad you're here. And he stood up on the desk and he said, you know, if anybody thought that they could, you know, get away with telling me to go fuck myself and keep their job. Well, Tony Greer just proved that you can. He's like, you know, <laughs> so I have open ears. And if anybody's got a problem, they want to talk about it with me. Let's go talk about it, you know, and it was a very positive thing. So and the problem is, is that the world doesn't operate like that anymore. You know, everything is probably that whole thing would have taken place, you know, electronically and all these emails behind closed doors. And it would have been a little pissing match and disgusting and never sorted out. Meanwhile, we can what we walked away professional friends and personal friends to this day after it. So, you know, well, I, I like that story about that time. Tony, you, you said so many things in there that I could get in so much political trouble for. I'm just going to let them be. But you're like, yeah. the new, you're like Ari from Entourage. You want to hug it out. I, I respect that. That's great. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to This Week in Trading History. Um, let's go back. Usually on This Week in Trading History, Patrick likes to give me a hard time and say that because uh, I'm a little older than Patrick. He likes to say that this were all, you know, we picked times from like 1922 or something. He says, do you remember that? And um this is one of them that's a little closer to uh, the present day. And we're going to only go back one year. And it, it's, it's hard to believe this, but it was one year ago today that the XIV blew up. And I, and I, I want to talk about this because I think it's a super interesting story that we should remember. So what's the XIV? X, X, 100%. Yeah. So the XIV was um, an ETN. Technically, it wasn't an ETF. It was an ETN that was, uh, was supposed to give twice the, uh, the, I guess, the return of the VIX, of the VIX index yeah. uh, kind of inverse, right? It was an inverse uh, VIX right. index, and it was leveraged. Is that right? Have I got it right, Tony? Is that right? Yes, the lower the, lower the VIX went, the higher the XIV went. But it was exactly leveraged, right? Exactly. It was, it was two leverage. times, yeah, right? Yeah, it was two times. Exactly. That was the important thing about it. It was two yes. times. Totally. And I remember getting on to Macro Voices and talking with Eric about this. And I, and I was worried at the time because the VIX kept going lower and lower and lower. And it was getting to, remember like a year ago or a year yeah. and a half ago, it was getting to what, single digit? Yep. And it wasn't that. Trading eight, but it eight and a quarter. Right. And, and, and when you think about it, I, I wasn't, I kind of was worried about something happening where, there's a geopolitical event and all of a sudden the thing that was the, the VIX was trading at yeah. nine or eight and a quarter, it opens up at 20. Exactly. So I was always kind of concerned about that, but I never ever in the wildest dreams would have thought that it would have just been like a whole bunch of traders stopping these guys out. And that's what in essence what happened. The, the XIV ended up going down almost a hundred percent overnight. And, and let's go, let's walk through this number and let's walk through how this worked. So here's the VIX index 
um, or it's actually not the VIX index, it's the VIX uh, ETF from 2009. And the, the problem with the VIX was that uh, during the great financial crisis of 07, 08, there were some guys who made absolute fortunes being long the VIX. So for the longest time, it's easy to forget now, but for the longest time, everyone thought that the, 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 the problems were gonna come back. They were very worried about it. So for everyone was always long VIX. Like I remember being like people telling me, oh, you gotta own VIX because it's gonna go back up and all this crap. But if you look at this chart, you'll realize what a money loser this was. And this is partly because the way that the curve works on the VIX futures is that the farm months always trade at wicked premiums. So those are the, that's how you get long VIX because you can't actually buy VIX. You actually do it through the futures. And um, those futures always trade at a higher than the spot price. Not always, but generally always trade at higher than the spot price. So there's a huge cost of carry. And what happens is not only did VIX go down, but also this cost of carry ate you up alive. So this chart is actually a regular chart and I've created another one that's logarithmic and you can see this logarithmic one. Oh, shit. Yeah. And so you can see the VIX, like the actual ETF went from uh, 120,000 down to 38 bucks. Like, like think about that. Uh, yeah, it's 120,000 to 38 bucks. The, the, the wealth destruction by being long VIX was unbelievable. Now, the thing is, that eventually people caught on. And in 15 and 16 and 17, people started to realize that this was a moneymaker being short the VIX. Forget people, dentists in Iowa were being <laughs> short the VIX. Yeah, that's right. Target managers, don't forget the target manager. Yeah, the target manager, right. Yeah, so people started shorting this thing with abandon. And, 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 uh, and the problem was, well, not the problem, but like all things that are a good idea at first, eventually they get taken to levels where they're no longer a good idea. So whereas it made sense when the VIX was 14 or 15 and should really be trading eight, once it went down to nine and everyone was shorting it, you know, hand over fist, it was a bad idea. And so like uh, Wall Street typically does, they created a product for it and they created the XIV. And the XIV was an ETN that was twice the inverse of this fix. So basically what it was trying to do was, was uh, kind of uh, create something that went the opposite way. Now this went really well and it was a great money maker and lots of people owned this thing for many, many years. And then what happened was in 2018, the market started to have a tough time in, I guess it was uh, late January, early February. And this is the chart of the S&P 500. And you'll see we were 28.50, we were kind of trading down. And then on February 5th, we had a huge spike down. Well, I, I say huge, but it's not actually that huge. Like when you think about it, we went from 27, what's that? 20, yeah, it was 100 S&P points, right? It was 100 S&P points. So, you know, it was bad, but it wasn't the end of the world. It wasn't a geopolitical event. It wasn't, there was nothing really that had happened. It was just kind of some bad news. But the interesting thing was the VIX. The VIX had gone, and interestingly enough, it, it had actually not gone up even as the market was falling. And it wasn't until that final day that it actually really started to spike. Going into the fourth, it, was, it had gone from 12 bucks to 14 bucks or 15 bucks. And then on the fifth, when we opened up, it opened at 16. And, and all day, it traded around between 17 and 15. 15. But then at the end of the day, something happened. They started just cranking the, the VIX futures. And this is the chart here that will show you the VIX future. And, and don't forget, the, the, the ETN has no way. You can't really buy VIX. Like, you can't go out and buy VIX. All you can do is buy the future. That's the only way to really get long VIX. And these guys wanted to be short VIX. So it was, it was they were short the future. Well, what happened here was you'll see the big blue bar or the big blue bar or rectangle. You'll see when it closed. The future closed that day at 22 bucks. Okay, so that was up a long way from earlier, it was 16 bucks. 
So it was up a long way. And if you think about the, the XIV uh, ETN, they are now double leverage short. So if you have something that goes from 15 and it's trading at 24 or whatever, all of a sudden, and you have twice leverage, all of a sudden you have a chance of getting stopped out and basically getting zero. Uh -huh. So Credit Suisse, which was on the other side of it, decided that they had that, that that was it. It had reached a point where they were tapping out and they were calling the note because they had basically sold the risk. And then what happened was the shit hit the fan. Look at what happened to the VIX future in the final half hour of trading. They took it from 22 up to $32. Like, like, like talk about gunning the stops. And that's in essence what happened, don't you think, Tony? Oh, 100%, 100% as I've heard it told in, in different forms, totally. There's, there's no way, it's not, had that ETN not grown to a billion dollars, there would not have been a bullseye on it and this event probably would not have happened. You're right. And, and they saw a chance to stop the guys out, to stop the ETN out. And so yeah. here's the next slide, you'll see what happened. The ETN that day before had closed at 115 and then it opened at uh, 10 bucks. Like Dirt Nap how, City. Dirt Nap City, you're absolutely right. right? It's just, it's just, it's, it's wild. It's wild. It was like, I think that you said it perfectly when you said that there was a bullseye on this thing. They oh, figured yeah. out that they could stop these guys out and they could go and they could goose the fixed futures. They were just waiting for a down day in the S&P when there was very little offerings and then they could goose the VIX futures higher and they stopped out a billion dollars of short ETF, of a short VIX. Like, do you yeah. think, like, like, that's how I interpret it. Do you, do you not agree? A hundred percent, a hundred percent and walked out of it short vol. Uh, but the great thing about it is they were short vol at 32 bucks or whatever. Yeah, that's what I mean. They walked out of it. They printed the whole stop on the ETN and the highs and walked out short. I mean, that was a mastermind on the order of the Lufthansa heist. Yeah. <laughs> no, Only a guy from I mean, Long Island would bring that up. <laughs> well, what's interesting, Kev, when I look back on 2018 and I still, I still stand by my, my – uh, you know, thought that the fourth quarter candle that we put in is going to haunt the market for, for months and quarters to come. But if you think about it, that was just the second shaky episode we had for, you know, the S&P and volatile markets. And we shouldn't forget that XIV episode because, you know, that birthed us into this higher vol regime that we're trading in now. And now, as you can see, you know, when the markets rally and volatility dips, the VIX is dipping to 15 bit at 18 and not eight bit at 10 anymore. So we're kind of pricing in, you know, a significant higher premium in the risk of the equity markets. And just understanding that and having that in your back pocket has been beneficial to, to trading all year last year and continues to be this year, in my opinion. I agree. And one thing that people should remember is that volatile markets is not bullish. Right. Markets, go, markets walk up, like, what is it? The walk up a staircase, go down the elevator. Yeah. And the yeah. fact that we're getting all sorts of wild swings up and down doesn't mean that, that like, increasing volatility is not a good sign. And they have a hundred percent. How, how I mean, you know, guys like I, uh, guys like us were having the conversation last year in the fourth quarter when the S and P had made its third 200 point lap between 2,800 and 2,600, you know, you know, one thing, just like you said, that is not healthy for your money. And that generally means there is some kind of a boom coming in the markets for sure. Yeah, I completely agree. Anyways, the XIV, you should go look it up. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a great story. It's, it's terrific. Well, I shouldn't say that because some people got just hammered. Uh, but shorting vol at uh, nine, that's tough for me to really feel sorry for you. Uh, it was kind of a, a dumb trade at that point. And it's when you do a dumb trade like that and, and it's big and the hedge funds can uh, and see it as a bullseye, as you say, you, you know it's, it's just you're just begging for an accident to happen. Exactly. So let's move on to the WTF clip of the week. Dinner that was reported about not too long ago, Mr. Secretary. <laughs> There's a dinner with the president, uh, the Fed chair, as well as the Fed vice chair. Has the president expressed to you a change in opinion of how Jerome Powell is doing? Mm -hmm. 
Sorry. Were you sleeping? <laughs> well, I think it was a productive dinner on Monday night. We had talked about uh, it, the potential for the Fed chair to meet the president. This is something that's occurred in the past. So let's play a game. Which body part do you need the least? Uh, I extended that invitation to Jay Powell on Friday at the request of the president. What? No. Pork sausage. You think I'm some sort of savage? And we, we had a very casual dinner up, up in the residence, I think. I think it was quite productive. Chairman Powell uh, gave the president a, an overview of the economy and what he was seeing, which was uh, quite strong and consistent with his public comments. Sorry. I shouldn't make jokes. And the president was quite engaged. We talked about everything from the economy to uh, the golf match with Tiger and Jack to the, the, the Super Bowl. We covered a, a wide range. It was a I think a terrific meeting for them to get to see each other. They had not met since uh, Jay Powell was put into office. So I think it was a productive meeting. Was there any acknowledgement of the pivot that the Fed chair has made in terms of his language and his message to the markets between October 3rd or even the end of December to the beginning of January? There was a marked pivot in terms of the, the Fed language and how it views future rate hikes and its balance sheet. My mother taught me not to throw stones at cripples. <laughs> but my father taught me to aim for their head. <laughs> uh, the Fed chair was very consistent in what he said to the president with what he's been saying publicly uh, in his press conferences. You don't look like a Theon Granger anymore. I think that uh, the Fed chair has been very clear in... But you're not a lord. I... You're just meat. In uh, looking at the economy and the Fed being clear that they have lots of different tools. Mm -hmm. Stinking meat. You freak. And it's, it's their job to continue uh, to focus on the growth of the economy. Right now, inflation is quite low, which is a, a very, very good thing. So, uh, I, again, I thought it was a very productive meeting. It was a, a casual meeting. Reek! That's a good name for you. What's your name? And uh, we enjoyed a, a wide range of topics with the president up in the Was residence. there a thank you from the president to the Fed chair? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Yeah. Fed Chair, for, for being easier now on rates. What's your name? No, there, were, there, were, there was not a thank you. There was a th Young Greyjoy. How do you guys walk that fine line? Because I'm sure the president just knowing his personality, would like to say, to Melissa's point, you're going to raise rates again this year. What is your name? My name is Rick. Okay. Tony, I have to ask you, are you a Game of Thrones fan? No, I am not. No? Oh, so you, so do you actually even know that? Like uh, that kind of meme about uh, Reek? Like you've never I, seen I, that. If I'm, I'll be totally honest with you. Yeah, I gave Game of Thrones about an, uh, two and a half episodes, and it didn't compare to The Sopranos to me, and I bailed. So, so all the nudity early on didn't get you? 
Nah, that's, that's not- the thing. The thing about Game of Thrones that kind of made me laugh was I was like, they were just so blatantly trying to keep all the kind of young males early yeah. by putting tons of nudity in it. Yeah, it's totally. Kind of disappointing because it's uh, they they don't need to do that. It's a great show, but anyways, um, I just think uh, well, let's talk a little bit about the uh, the dinner that they had. And can you imagine being Powell and getting invited to the dinner with Trump? No, like it's just it's just shocking. Like it it kind of makes me laugh. I the the funniest part about it was that uh, the Powell insisted that Clarita come with him. Did you see that part? Like, it, like I think he was invited alone. And he says, "Yeah, but I'm coming. I'm bringing somebody." Oh, that's and great! He, I didn't see that. Yeah, and he brought his vice chair or whatever it is because he's like, "I need somebody like that's going to be able to." Yeah, back I, need up. A, I need a buffer for this knucklehead, right? <laughs> totally. So I just think, uh, you know, we don't need to beat the dead horse because I've gone on and on about Powell and his flip flopping, and, and oh, you nailed it, Kev. You deserve a lot of credit, man. I mean, you nailed it early when it was still hard to tell and i give you a lot of credit for that well even the blind squirrel finds an acorn every now and then but uh i yeah, just i, I he's actually surprised me how much he's flopped i didn't think he would flop this much and so you know nope. giving me credit but i don't know if i deserve it because i'm shocked at how much he's flipping and uh it's no you do much- because that's what trading is about is starting to move your attitude and change your opinion at the right times and you 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 nailed it on the curve there is what you did. So that was well, very well done. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Um, you're all. obviously much nicer than Patrick. We should keep you on instead of Patrick. Okay, <laughs> let, let's move on to the top five things to watch next week. But before we do that, let's go over the top five things to watch last week that we talked about. And so number five was platinum. And you and I were yes, kind of sir. trying to figure out, um, you're a big commodity guy. You used to work on the uh, Coma yeah. store, right? Yes. So what do you think of, of platinum? It just, uh, I'm going to pull up the chart here and put it up. Uh, it doesn't seem to be able to get off the mat. I don't have, I really don't have a strong opinion of platinum or palladium, even though I did trade base metals at Goldman Sachs. I was perplexed by the book when I ran it and I'm equally perplexed by their price action now. So I stay away from those. <laughs> well, at least you're honest enough. That's never stopped me from uh, saying my opinion on stuff. But anyway. <laughs> No, I'm okay, not, let's I'm go not. on to lumber and the home builders. And so lumber, where does lumber trade, by the way? Is that at the nine, like, is, is that in New York or is that in Chicago? Uh, I think it's in Chicago. I'm 90% sure. Let's just check it out. Uh, like, they're just, I, I find lumber kind of the only commodity that still goes up and down limits on a regular basis. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a short story about that. Yeah, sure. I, when I was in the uh, GSCI ring um, in Chicago, the lumber pit was right next to it. And I used to be amazed that the lumber, um, basically the lumber ring in the morning, yeah. right before the open is seven Italian guys having a conversation <laughs> with each other. And then the market would open, limit up, and they'd all look at each other, <laughs> limit up, limit up, limit up, and they'd all go home for the day. And they do that for about three or four days in a row before they would get to some liquidity. But it seemed like a very, very shady market on the Mercantile Exchange in Chicago. I'll tell you that. Okay, so wait, I got to tell a story here. Go ahead. Even though your name is Tony Greer, and Greer is like, I, I remember when you started saying something one time and you said something about your Italian background. And I was like, what the hell? Like, Greer, isn't that it? Like, Irish. Right, right. And you, and you kind of let me, you, you kind of told me that you're seven eighths Italian, right? Like, I am. Yeah. Mathematically, yes, I am. That's right. So it's mostly, even though you have a career last name, it is like uh, one Irishman figured out how to get his name through the kind of the lineage of your household. And you're really just Italian. <laughs> that's pretty much the well, that's perfectly put, man. <laughs> so, 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 so some Irish wise guy smarter than all the other Italians <laughs> got his name back to the end of us, right? So I got to tell you a story, everyone, about the, uh, Tony. He, he writes a piece this morning about how he's uh, at some farm conference. And I guess you were speaking at somewhere like they, they, they hauled you out to commodities round table. Yeah. I was speaking to about 50 farmers in Memphis at a commodity round table about macroeconomics. Okay. And then he starts bragging about how he's traded his um, a, a year of his newsletter for a, like, I don't know, a couple of, crates of hair, like tomatoes and I was like, I was like yeah. only an Italian would be bragging about trading his, his, his newsletter, his financial newsletter for some, for some tomatoes. 
Yeah, but that speaks to a very specific deficit that we have here on our barrier island. Like we don't get any good tomatoes from anywhere, right? And and if you, you grow tomatoes here, you have a tough time doing it with all the salt water at sea level and all the water. And what winds up happening is that nobody has tomatoes until like the last week in August, and then everybody has 90 bushels of tomatoes. And yeah. so it doesn't do you any good. So this, you know, my friend there, my friend Blake agreed to send me two gigantic boxes at least a year of these of these Kellogg heirloom breakfast tomatoes with these special seeds that he has. And this kid is growing so much beautiful vegetation in his uh, garden that he's swapping out with local farm to table restaurants on a regular basis for meals for his wife. He was, he was, you think that was a good barter. This is a guy that shows up to his friend's farm to table restaurant with a bag of arugula, hands over the arugula and says, okay, me and my wife will take Valentine's dinner Friday night at seven o'clock here. You, you know go. what I mean? And that pays for that. So I think it's kind of cool. So I was like, I thought, you know, in the spirit of the moment, I was like, if you can get me two shipments of those tomatoes a year, I'll sell you my newsletter for that. And he was like, done, bro. So we struck a deal right there. I just love you Italians. That's just, that's, that just sums up uh, your, your kind of attitude. And I think it's terrific. Okay, I'm let's go back to, to the I'm market. To fresh mozzarella. Go ahead. That's right. <laughs> so lumber, um, it did actually, I'll pull it up here. It did kind of roll over. Uh, but the home builders, uh, you don't know this, but uh, Patrick and I have a huge bet on about home builders outperforming bonds. And actually, I'd be curious what you think. I bet a year ago, that the ITB Home Builder Index would outperform TLT. So what do you think, Tony? Am I going to win my bet? It's a big steak dinner at a nice restaurant in Toronto. Um, no, I'm bearish builders. I'm going to say oh. I, I was bearish when we had this conversation a while ago. I went down, uh, went down, you know, XHB I was looking at, but ITB seems to have made about the same move and gone down about 8 to 10%. Um, I even think with rates pulling back that uh, given the inventory situation and given the inventory situation versus pressing in a little bit of a slower economy, I think the home builders are going to struggle, Kev. I, you know what? And all kudos to you. You actually did shit all over my home builders call when I did it way back when. But I think I it's did. money. I think it's money good now. I think it's a great trade. But that's what makes a market. All right. You're doubling down. Noted. Yeah, that's right. Uh, let's go on to the next thing, which is... Powell speaking on Wednesday uh, when you and I were kind of doing the pre-show uh, preparation and we realized that neither one of us remembered what he said Wednesday. So it couldn't have been that important. Uh, Powell's, head, Powell's head officially spun around 360 degrees <laughs> and he no longer has anything left in him. Right. So Wednesday was a non-event. That's right. Okay. And then the next thing we were watching was yields, meaning bonds. And they, if you remember last Friday, they had, they had kind of, Bonds had had a big up day, but then what happened was we had a huge unemployment number that kind of caught everyone off guard. And the big question was, was that going to be the bottom in yields, meaning the top in, in bonds? But if you look here, we actually had kind of one or two days when bonds went down, but we're right back at the levels before the unemployment number. Yeah, just a rate mash since yeah. then. And... Literally. uh I'm, I'm not one to always, uh, I, I, I'll, ultimately, I'm a long-term bond bear. I really am. But I think the economy is rolling over, and I think we're going to be surprised that, that the Raul Paul, Patrick Ceresna, uh, Lacey Hunt kind of story works for the next little while, and bonds are a buy. And to me, the action that we see now, the fact that we couldn't, even after that great unemployment number, couldn't rally bonds, meaning like, you know, yields went back down or sorry, yields couldn't rally and the bonds couldn't go back down. I think it means that the bond bear market for the time being is over and that we're in a bull market. And that's what, what, what do you think? Like, but like, do you, do you buy that? Um, it's put it this way. I did not want to, I would, I, I still like you, like, I want to believe that the generational peak in the bond market was 2016, that we're not going to go back to that scenario ever again. Um, but uh, you know, I have to respect the change in data and I have to respect the rate of change in yields. So when, you know, the, uh, it doesn't matter what I think Kev, when the 20, when the 10 year U S yield goes from 325 to 255 in three months, 
my view goes out the window and I start paying attention to what's going on. And, um, you know, with, with rates breaking so swiftly through all the moving averages in a very decisive move, I mean, it's impossible for me to sit here and be a bond bear with a straight face. So I just have nothing but respect for this move higher in bonds, to be totally honest with you. You're a true slave to the tape. I like it. Okay, let's go on to number one, which is the, uh, the stock market. And we were kind of speculating whether it was a fake out or breakout from the Fed. So let's look, in, first of all, and see how it actually did. Let me pull the chart up and bring it up here. So uh, when we left last Friday, the market had come, uh, where are we here? So what happened? I'm just trying to remember. Oh, yeah, that's right. It was a big up day after the unemployment number. Remember, bonds got schmooked, yep. uh, yep. stocks went up, and since then, that that big day, it's just we've rolled right back over. And then right. Here we are today, and we're kind of, again, once again, at the level right before the big unemployment number, like it didn't happen. So do you think the stock market's in trouble? Like, do you think that this is it? Are we about to roll over? Uh, I, I tell you, I place... Uh a high uh, probability on the chances that that was it for the rally. I mean, you know, the rally probably extended a lot farther than it deserved to extend. Uh, um, it was clearly manufactured or at least kicked off um, by Steve Mnuchin and some machinations of communication and action. Um, you know, and I don't know that you're going to be able to, you know, we, we just put the Fed in a box in the last week, Kev, and I think that's the biggest deal going on in the markets is that you know Powell was trying to be hawkish because the data was strong and he succumbed to the stock market. And now people are gonna look at him when, if the stock market rallies and says, okay, you're gonna price in rate cuts now or not? You know, because the US economy is still going strong and I do, like you, I have to respect that the economy feels like it's turning over a little bit. I still think the US can be the strongest horse in that race by a long shot. So I'm still gonna bet that you know there's a, a move at some point higher in yields that also keeps tipping the equity market over. But my big thing is that, you know, Fang saw its best day and we saw peak Silicon Valley um, in 2018 and this year is gonna be a struggle for that whole sector. Well, you know, you're a big guy, US dollar, um, well not US dollar, actually you are a US dollar bull, but I believe you're also a US stock market bull versus the rest of the world. I'll take yeah. the other side of that trade, but that's a story for another day. But I, I really do believe that the stock market is at the very least that that unemployment number seemed to me got the last of the bears worried. I, before that, I was, I, I was concerned that we had too many short-term guys that were still betting against the market. So going into that number kind of midweek last week, I, I said to, to, to Patrick, I said, it feels to me like a lot of guys are still leaning short. And uh, I felt like until we got those guys like getting like getting off, get the, getting them off the books, getting those positions off the ship, yeah. it felt like it wasn't going to roll over. I really feel yeah. that that there's a good chance that that unemployment number got the last of the the shorts out of the market, and that we're now back at the point where we can go and uh, drift back lower. And I, I guess the fact that it coincided with the 200-day moving average is just um, you know, maybe it's just a coincidence, but it's, oh, it's really cool. <laughs> you guys in your squiggles. Anyways. Okay. Let's move on to the five things to watch next week. So um, here we go. Number five, the German 10 year bond yield. It ticked at below 10 basis points this week. Will that get worse? Like I, I just think let's pull up a chart of this thing. This is just unbelievable how bad it's been. Like I've just been, and I'll be honest. I've been completely wrong on this thing. I've thought that uh, ones, yeah, me yeah. and Bill Gross. Have you seen that Bill Gross recently retired and then he announced that during the, his time at Janus, his biggest problem was that he was always looking at being short Boone's long uh, U.S. Treasuries. Oh my God! Yeah, I just kind of laugh and hey, listen. <laughs> I feel, I feel his pain because that's the trade that I that I love. Yeah, um, and I think the fact and listen. Before, I think the fact that he's retiring on that trade is a Julian Robertson kind of moment in the yeah. US, you know, U.S. 10-year uh, German Bund spread trade. And uh, But anyways, here's the chart. Look at this thing. Just like it just looks like death. We had that double back. bottom at 15 basis points. And then, you know, the last, uh, the last 
EU downgrade of the economy there was the real, you know, that was what tumped everything over. It just looks awful. Like, and, and, and here we are, let's look at it. We, we went negative way back when in June of 2016, which is an aside. The funniest part about that trade was that Bill Gross, when it was trading at like negative eight basis points, said it was a once in a lifetime trade. And he said, like, you should back up the truck and, and be short boons. And then all of a sudden, the thing went from negative eight basis points to like 50 basis points. You know, this move here in September of, of 16. Yeah. And he did that in, a, in no time at all, in like in a quarter. And Bill Gross managed to lose money because that guy, he has never seen an option that the bid that he isn't willing to hit. That guy is short volatility every single way that he could possibly be. Short. He is such a, a like a short vol trader. Like I, you know, I grew yeah. up on an index uh, derivative desk, and I I like being short vol, but that guy scares even me. Like he's always short vol, and yeah. so he found a way of having a once in a lifetime opportunity of being like of his call. Like he literally called it. He came out and said, "You got to be short boons. This is ridiculous and stuff." He had like this great call and then lost money on it because he was short. Like not only was he short um, calls, he shorted some puts like a jackass. Like I, like that guy is just anyways, I just think it's unbelievable. But now here we are. Yeah. And we're back down. We've, we've gone from 55 basis points down to eight, like nine basis points. It's just redonkulous. Like the fact that this thing's trading at nine basis points. And I, I, I don't know whether this is going to be the bottom and it's uh, that this is kind of peak uh, Euro skeptics and stuff. Like, I what think, do you think? Yeah, I think, I think European yields are just, just waiting for Mario Draghi to either die or leave office and then maybe they'll go up. I don't know. I, I think that I, I'm a big believer that the Europeans need to spend, do some fiscal and that the real problem is that they become Japan. And that and the, the, the more that they try to solve their problem through monetary instead of fiscal, the, the more that this, this shit will continue. And they just don't seem to be able to wake up. But that's probably a story for another day. Let's yep. go to the next one. The next one. Um, oh, wait. Let me get rid of this. Thing. Next one. Oh, there we go. Next there we one. go. Hopefully that's not 10. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to break last week's record for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I, although Patrick and I were kind of having a laugh because when we drink ours, you know, like you are drinking American beer, which isn't really beer. It's a diuretic. Ah. And I, know, <laughs> I know I probably just made all my American uh, listeners all mad at me, but uh, uh, it's the truth. Um, ours are big ones. We're drinking 473 milliliters. So we are drinking a little lo- bit larger than you. We drink the tall nice. boys. So uh, your five was not really like, it's like three. Anyways, let's go to number four. Will commodities get off the mat? And you had a, you had a great uh, kind of thing in, in your uh, morning navigator. Why don't you just uh, highlight what you uh, brought up this weekend uh, on Friday? Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess, you know, I, I was just looking at, you know, the, the fact that Goldman Sachs is about to leave the commodity business as a potentially, you know, capitulative bottom you know, when I look at the Bloomberg Commodity Index over, you know, like a 30-year chart, you know, the index has gone from, you know, when I got out of college in 1990, it was here at 80, and it had a little bit of a bump up to 100, you know, in the mid-90s, but it traded up to 240, essentially, with, you know, crude oil running up as high as $140 in the mid-2000s, um, and here we are back at 80. And Goldman is leaving the commodity business. And when I look at the life cycle of the Bloomberg Commodity Index, you know, they really, yeah, there it is. Um, You know, that starts right there where Goldman Sachs bought Jay Aaron in 1981. And they probably had uh, several years of a great run within that. And, you know, when Lloyd Blankfein is leaving the firm, that speaks directly to the commodity business where he came from. Um, and who I reported to when I was there. So that obviously changes the face of the way firm looks at commodities. And it looks like um, David Solomon is going to take it in a little bit of a different direction. Um, I also know a couple of the most talented commodity traders that you know I've ever met in my career um, just recently left Goldman Sachs in the last several years. And that's basically them, you know, cleaning out the, uh, you know, cleaning out the area and saying, we're moving on to something new. But you know, just like the Glencore IPO marked the peak in 
to mint for commodities. Um, and I'll look up the year, but I think it was around 08 or so, or within f three or four years of that. Um, I think that this Goldman Sachs pulling out could mean a similar bottom in commodities, but I try to be a bull of commodities when they're trading around the cost of production like oil is. Um, and I try to be bullish when grains are on their back like they are. And, you know, that's all, Kev. It, it, it may play into something like that. It may not. But, you know, it could be in one of those indicative sentiment signals that we should at least keep an eye on. I, I couldn't agree more. I, you know, I, I think it's Michael Lewis talked about in Liar's Poker, the fact that Solomon Brothers closed their money market division the summer of 87. Yeah. And, and it was interesting because I think that it, after the crash of 87, the equity crash of 87, that was the most profitable de department for everybody because everyone rushed to money market. And, yeah. uh, you know, after being working for a bank and seeing the decisions that were made by management, I, I can't tell you the number of times that if they tap you out on a trade or they, uh, or they or get rid of a division, it means you should be loading up the PA on that, that, that trade or that division yeah. like, or that, you know, cause it's just, they seem to get it wrong so many times over yeah. and over again. And the fact that they're, that they're cutting back on the commodities to me means that these things are going to rip. Like that's, I really believe that. Yeah. Especially after the last two years where they've literally been left for dead, where gold has been left for dead in this range range between 1200 and 1400 and with you know the volatility in the s p lately gold has picked its head up with the rally in the bond market and the growth of the uh, pool of negative yielding securities gold has picked its head up so that those are the, you know i love to see this going on at least those little buds in the in, uh in the commodity business going along while goldman sachs is figuring out where to put the furniture that used to be in the commodity trading desk <laughs> <laughs> it's because he's too busy putting it in his DJ booth. That's yeah, exactly the, uh, yeah, where people go and see his laptop play. That that's, that's right. It's a little aside for those that don't not get that joke. It's because uh, pa uh, Tony and I are big fans of different bands, but we we enjoy uh, I would say more traditional kind of music. Yeah. We we Classic like seeing people. Format. Yeah, yeah, we very... like to see people play instruments and stuff. And uh, yeah. Jared yes. Dillian, uh, the Dirt Nap of Dirt Nap fame, he is a huge electronic uh, what is, electronic dance. He's an music. actual DJ, yeah, house yeah. music. Yeah. So uh, one time when the two of them were having a dispute on Twitter, I sent them something and it was basically somebody uh, that was saying, come see my laptop live. <laughs> Cause I don't weird. like, I just don't get the whole idea. And it's just, I, I you know, I'm too old obviously to understand electronic da dance music. And I'm too old to understand why people would go see someone hit play on their computer and yep. then uh, and then do a heart sign and and do it. But anyway, so be it. That's 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 just me. Let's move on to number three. Fang, does it drag the whole market down? What do you think, Tony? Yeah, I'm a Fang bear. Um, if you look at Fang by itself, uh, you can see that it's retraced to some big resistance levels and is failing so far. But I'm still, you know, I'm leaning on the social situation, Kev. Where um, you know Amazon. Here's here's Amazon. We saw a peak. Amazon, um, you know, back in September, that just happened to coincide with the Forbes cover of Bezos Unbound, you know, that came out the first weekend in September. And uh, as you can see, that marks the absolute high in stock. Oh, excuse me, that was the first weekend in October Bezos Unbound came out. I'm sorry. So that marked the second. Yeah, it's pretty close. Pretty close. Yeah. Like it's like almost the top. Yeah, I mean, it, it was close enough to be the top. And, you know, I just look at when you take a step back. And the fact that Amazon was one of those classic stocks within the XIV blow up that was just sort of chooching higher every day. It ran into this huge sentiment bubble with the Bezos Unbound thing. And now while the world is getting wise to surveillance capitalism and taking a step back and saying, wait a minute, wait a minute here, you know, you guys are selling our information. Maybe this isn't cool. Yeah, Amazon is going ahead and opening up a new headquarters in New York and in, in, in D.C. And they want to put an Alexa inside your room, your bedroom, your bathroom, your hotel room, your car, your van, your taxi and everything. And yeah. I just feel like it is a direct conflict with the awareness that's going on of people looking around and saying, yeah, I'm actually not comfortable with being advertised back to every time I click on my phone. Yeah. So, you know, I, I just feel like you're going to see uh, the sentiment is going to swing dramatically against 
Silicon Valley. And, and I think there will be eventually backlash and pushback and, you know, people leaving platforms, et cetera. Not that we're going to leave Amazon, but I think this guy is absolutely batshit crazy if he thinks there's going to be an Alexa in every hotel room, um, personal bedroom, bathroom, and car. I just don't think that the public is ready for that. Well, so it was September 30th was the, t the date. So let's go look at the chart here. September ah, okay. 30th. So it was, I knew it was right at the end of October. Yeah. I mean, Shit, beginning it, of October. It, it was honestly the top. Like, it rolled over. That was the top. There's another well, example of the... Uh, the sentiment, right? Cover. Yeah. Well, little did we know Bezos Unbound would really mean something else. <laughs> exactly. With little shots <laughs> going around that. You know, I, I, I got to give him credit. Like, he, this is, we're taping this Friday, and I guess, was it this morning he announced it, or last night he announced he was going to basically stick it to the... Uh, National Enquirer and not bow to their extortion attempts. Oh boy. Did boy you see up. that? Like the, yeah. the, 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 um, it's going to get good. This is going to get entertaining. Yeah. Well, I, I guess all guys with a big unit as you know, don't bow to the extortion attempts. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to number two. Okay. Let me well just get rid of this. Okay. Let's uh, number two, U.S. dollar. Will it finally break out in a direction? And I think this is a, a, a really important thing to talk about because I've noticed a huge shift in sentiment where ever since um, Powell's flip, all of the U.S. dollar bulls have given up. And I said last week, I said something to the effect that Given the shift in sentiment in terms, or sorry, given the shift in Powell's view, I'm surprised the U.S. dollar is not down more. And I kind of thought to myself, if you get a situation where you get all sorts of bad news and yet it doesn't go down that much, that's bullish. Yeah. And sure enough, we've been rallying all week and we're kind of still stuck in a range, no doubt about that. But uh, given the, the fact that the Fed is supposedly easy and all those people that believe that the U.S. dollar only trades on uh, kind of yield spreads have been scratching their heads because look at that. It's, it's rallied even as the Fed has gone more dovish. What yeah. do you think? Uh, I remain a dollar bull. Um, I still think this is going to be the best investment center in the world, um, you know, in the next couple of years. I feel like we're getting micro evidence of that with, um, you know, the recent G, uh, um, the recent PMI data around the world from China right through Europe, um, you know, dipping right back to 50, where we're on the edge of economic growth, and you see the U.S. PMI still up around 55. I feel like we're going to see a persistent situation where the U.S. economy is better than the rest of the world and holding in better, um, which is going to be, you know, sort of the delayed effect of more, you know, of Trump's make America great again policy. And I think that'll be the only thing that can keep rates up uh, here in the US. So I, I continue to be a dollar bull, but I really just want to be a dollar pacifist because I see guys fighting so aggressively over it. And the thing is between 95 and 97. And uh, the truth is that it's really going nowhere. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, you know? Twitter, FinTwit is just filled with guys fighting about this. And I'm like, holy shit, like, like take a break. Like it's Yeah, they're talking about like the absolute like, existence of it as a reserve currency you know what i mean and you're like yeah. well maybe when it gets volatile we can talk about that but as far as it not trading anymore i think that that's conversation is uh i don't know i just think that there are a thousand better trades to go chase down on the s and uh on the board not the s p on the board yeah and, no i i i couldn't completely agree i'm not sure uh whether it's headed lower or higher but i do watch like even though i'm not much of a technician i do watch the price action versus sentiment and as i said the fact that it won't go down with all this bearish news seems to me it, it's showing that it wants to go higher let me ask and, you a question kevin yeah. if i would if i were to ask you the question if you were to ask me what do i think about rates and i I said, well, the next rate move could be higher or it could be lower. Would you take me seriously anymore or no? <laughs> you mean the fact that that's what the Fed's saying? Yeah, essentially. And, and Yellen came out just the other day and literally said that in the same quote. She was like, you know, I expect the economy to be strong, but I expect it to pull back. And, you know, I expect that the next rate move might be higher and it might be lower. And I was like, okay, at what point do we not have to listen to you anymore? Yeah, I, I, I think that the trend... Even though I, I think long term that the, 
that the U.S. dollar will lose its reserve, or not lose, will struggle to continue to be the reserve currency that it is. I think that the that the trend towards higher rates is still, or sorry, higher dollar is still intact. Yeah, and me too. even even though people, even though I want it to be, not want it to be, even though I I think it's going to eventually not be the case. I, I I actually think that Brent, uh, you know, Johnson with the San Diego Capital, that his argument is is still holding water, and and yep. it hasn't, you know, it hasn't really done anything that, uh, as you say, it's still in a range, and not only that, it's at the top of the range. So I think that watching it is uh, is a is uh, is really important. And I saw Raul Paul from Real Vision the other day saying that he thinks it's still going to be the surprise of the year is going to be an upside break on the dollar. And given the fact that all the uh, bears, I mean, sorry, all the bulls seem to have given up and yet we're still sitting at the top of the range leads me to believe that he might be right. Even though I don't know if I want him to be, or even though I don't think in the long run, it's going to be the right trade. I'm kind of thinking from the trader in me says to me, says that this thing could head higher. Anyways, let's go on to number one. Number one. Will Mrs. Big Picture Trading let Patrick back in the house after being away on work, quote unquote, for three of the last four weekends? I'm saying no shot. <laughs> no shot. I, I tend to agree with you. This guy, like I was kind of <laughs> laughing when he kind of said to me, he said, you know, Kev, you're going to have to find somebody because uh, I, I can't be there. I'm going to be working. And I said, where are you going to be? He says, I'm in uh, San Francisco. And I said, holy shit, you've been away for like three of the last four weekends. I would have had a divorce way before this point. <laughs> My wife would have got, got rid of me. But uh, Mrs. Big Picture Trading seems to love him and uh, thinking for, you know, better or worse. And for, you know, working three out of four weekends, I don't know. Like he seems to have a, he seems to have figured it all out. Sounds like he's wearing the pants in the relationship. I guess so. Although I wonder if she's going to listen and she'll be phoning in. Oh, shit. She can listen to this? I doubt it. I, doubt <laughs> it. I don't know if she's any, if she's like my wife. There's not a chance that she listens to it. Okay. Right, exactly. So, Tony, it's been a lot of fun. We're going to end with um, kind of a parting uh, wisdom. And this was yours. So, why don't you tell me a bit, little bit about it and uh, where it comes from? Yeah, it's a really simple. Uh, proposition. It, it's a twofold thing, actually, uh, because it applies on a micro and macro level. But the fact of the matter is time kills all trades. And that's useful to keep in mind, you know, if you're applying for a job, you know, a big picture thing like that, you know, you want to stay hot on the connection because it feels like the longer time goes by, the less of a chance that you get that job is. And, you know, the time kills all trades in the sense that if you put a position on with some conviction and you put your stop above the market or below it and you know you put your take profit on the other side and you're sitting there and wearing yourself away and, and neither side is getting executed, you're basically just causing yourself a lot of excessive you know, mental torture during the process. So that's sometimes a period where I like to keep that time as kills all trades and say, you know, in addition to having a price parameter, it's important to have a time parameter on my trade as well. This way, I'm not just sort of battling in my brain what I expect to happen, and there's really nothing happening. So, you know, like, I, I just think it's a useful thing to keep in mind, you know, time kills all trades, no matter what it is, you know, stay hot on the topic, stay focused on things, get them done and move on to the next thing. Because when you leave something lingering, you know, as a, as a business developer and entrepreneur, I notice when things get left on the bottom of my to-do list, they eventually get kicked off the to-do list. So if you have something that you're really interested in, stay focused on it and work it to through fruition until it's done. Same thing as a trade, man. Time's running out. Every time you put a position on, your money deserves good treatment. And if it's sitting there doing nothing, find another home for it. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think that too often people don't take into, into account the idea of a time stop. Yeah. If something is not working as you expected, there's a good chance you're wrong. Like is the first thing I, I think. Like if you're expecting the market to go up and it doesn't go up now, like it, it's obviously it's different. It's like long-term trades are different, but for as a, as a pure trader, if you're sitting there and you're saying, I see X, Y, and Z, and then it's not happening, chances are you're wrong. Yeah. At the very least you should get it off the sheets. And, and so I know I completely uh, embrace that idea of having a time stop as well as a price stop. So I think it's a great, uh, 
most importantly, Kev, for the mental, when you think about it, like you nailed the parameter, but consider the mental anguish that you go through. Put yourself in the position and say, you know, I've got a 59 stop. I bought it at 60 and I want it to go to 70. And here it is at 60 and a quarter. And here goes time goes by and it's still 60 and a quarter. And all you're doing is wasting mental energy on it. And while you might be right, that mental energy might be better spent somewhere else. I completely agree. That's okay, so like let's let's move on. So, uh, Tony, I just want to thank you. Uh, it's been great to having you sub in for Patrick while he's quote unquote working. My pleasure. Um, and uh, for those who don't know, they should go visit his website, uh, Tony's website at tgmacro.com. At that uh, website, you can sign up for a free, no obligation, one week trial of his weekly newsletter, The Morning Navigator. I get it all the time. I just, uh, I love it. And uh, I think it's terrific. And uh, everyone should go sign up and uh, get a taste of what uh, you can get with Tony. He's uh, a true uh, surfer of the waves. And it's great to always kind of, you know, you're, you trade much differently than me, but I find it very helpful in that you're kind of pointing out different things than I am. Like you're, you're noticing uh, different kind of uh, trading patterns and different kind of uh, trading opportunities than I am. And I think it's just terrific. And I think everyone should, uh, should sign up for it. Thanks very much, Kel. I really appreciate that endorsement coming from you. I mean, as a macro tourist reader for years, um, I appreciate your take on the markets and I can't thank you enough for uh, subscribing to the note. That's really cool. We'll take care of anybody that comes in for a trial. That's terrific. Okay. Well, so for everyone else, um, if you want to follow um, Tony on Twitter, you should definitely do that. What, Tony, what's your uh, Twitter handle? At TG Macro, T-G-M-A-C-R-O. Yeah, you should do that. Tony is a big fan of 80s music and uh, he has a lot of, uh, I think we've had a lot of back and forth in terms of, uh, he, he yes. recently confessed to me that uh, The Cure was instrumental in his uh, de emotional development as a teenager. Uh. Absolutely. Played a huge role. Played a huge role. And don't, don't forget, I am getting our 80s uh, progressive rock conference call notes together behind the scenes. That is happening. And, and just for the, those who don't realize it, we're, we're laughing about this because recently Brent Johnson from Santiago Capital uh, owned up to what, what, was the, what was the song that he thought was really great? I can't remember. I can't remember either, man. We went through so many songs from the era. It, I think it was a Cure song. Or no, no, it was an Erasure song. That's right. And, yes. uh, and, and then Tony and I got on there and started admitting all the songs that we liked. And, 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 uh, and Brent gave us a big shout out saying, thank you for being a, a, you know, confident enough in your masculinity for admitting that you like those songs. So, oh, yeah. uh, and actually, I was quite surprised. I thought Tony, because uh, Tony is a big Van Halen fan as well. Yeah. So I thought he was going to be not a chance. He's going to like Erasure or like The Cure. And I was quite surprised. Like, uh, like I, I'm just kind of still shocked to this day. Like, so you liked Van Halen and also kind of synth pop. Is that right, Tony? Yeah, you know, I was, I'm, a, I'm a trader at heart, man. You know what I mean? Like, I love <laughs> right. metal and stuff. But when I, I have some other stuff coming out, you know, like, you know, I don't know, Rock the Casbah that I could dance to, I start turning towards you know, a little more progressive rock and punk rock and things like that. And you wind up landing on, you know, the cure and, and, and Depeche mode. And that's a big, big part of your, uh, you know, your adolescent years. And that's going to stay with you for a long time, no matter what. Right. That's true. I always say people like the music that they, uh, when they were 15 to 16 years old, the best. When everyone, yeah. when he asked someone what the best music was, it was whatever they were when they were 15 or 16, or maybe it's, yeah. 15, I don't know, but it's whatever they, you know, whatever they were at that age, that's the best music in the world. No doubt. Uh, you know, no for doubt. those that are like, that, that were 15 or 16 in the mid nineties, you guys are wrong. Like that was terrible <laughs> music, <laughs> but so be it. Okay. Right. So uh, for those that uh, let's just kind of finish up here. Patrick usually does all this stuff. Uh, let me just figure out what I need to say. All right. That's right. Oh, yeah. So, um, okay. Thanks for spending some time with us. Please visit our site at markethuddle.com to sign up to receive our weekly email that will include a link to the show and the charts that we discuss. Rest assured, we will never clog your email with junk and we will only send you our weekly letter and updates for upcoming shows. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at, at themarkethuddle.com. Uh, I'm at Kevin Muir and Patrick's at, at uh, Patrick Ceresna, or at least I hope he is. Um, anyways, thank you very much, Tony. It's been a pleasure doing this show with you. It's been a lot of fun, and we hope to have you on again. Hey, anytime, man. Thanks for having me, Kev. Okay, take care.
kidding. <laughs> you driving home from here, Tim? Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm walking. Um, oh, nice. How about you, bud? Uh, you're in your home already, right? I'm in my home office. I'm going to go eat the big CD that I made and uh, kick back and relax tonight. Okay, here we go. Edit out here. Nice. Hey, thanks, Tony. That was a lot of, I think it was great. It was Man, we covered a lot of ground. That was good. What time is it? 6.04. What did, when did we start? Do you remember? Just at 420, I think. Remember? Because we were talking about the cannabis talk at 420. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, shit. It's going to be long. Oh, well, okay. It's going to be long, dude. Cut some down. <laughs> no, no. It's okay. I'll just leave it. All right. I'll just leave it. Anyway, thanks again, Tony. You go have uh, dinner with your, your family, and, and thank yeah. you. I really appreciate it, buddy. Anytime, dude. Anytime. That was fun. And literally, ask me anytime you need me. I'm happy to help you out. Okay. Thanks again. Take care. Have yeah, a great bro. weekend. You too, pal. Okay. Bye-bye. Cheers.